Earlier today, I completed an interview for my podcast with Jamie Salter and Dr. Katie Croce, the two developers of the system of self-management or self-monitoring called Self and Match. I wanted to share with you part of that discussion as a blog post in the hopes of getting you to think about the importance of teaching children how and why they should focus on monitoring their own behavior and not just leaving the behavior correction and assessment up to the adults. This week on the Just 7 Steps blog. We realized that our mentors have been researching self-monitoring since the 70s. They have been publishing articles on self-monitoring since before we were born. But what they hadn't done is that they hadn't like brought it into everyone's toolbox. So we were like, how do we bring this more into the mainstream? I mentioned in my intro, you know, that 20 plus years I've been doing this and there wasn't a lot of discussion about uh, self-management um, or self-monitoring of any kind. And in fact, I don't think, I can't remember anyone talking about it until I came to your workshop. And uh, um, so the, the fact that you both had mentors who had been uh, on the scholastic side uh, doing research and stuff related to this uh, and then put you two together, uh, I think maybe it was, uh, you know, kismet, like it was meant to happen. So that's good. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's true. I think that a lot of times when we would go to conferences, we would look through those little books and see all the different topics and, and self-monitoring wasn't one you were seeing come up yeah. very often. And, yeah. and it's seen that now when we go to conferences, we kind of flip through the books and look and, and you're starting to see more and more. And that's our goal. One of our main goals is whether it's self match or other self-monitoring tools, this should be in everyone's toolbox. This should be in, in behavior analyst toolboxes. And so how do we get that into the research more? How do we get that into the, the practical world more so that people are seeing this as a, a tool to add to their, their toolbox? Uh, maybe tell us a little bit about just the, you know, the elevator pitch about what is self and match, uh, how it works, who's it for, uh, and that's that sort of thing. On a, on a global level, self and match is an evidence-based self-monitoring system that's used in schools, homes, clinics, group homes, camps, colleges, universities, and it is a a tool to systematically teach individuals how to self-reflect on their own behavior. We, like Katie mentioned, so many tools out there are us telling kids how they do, us telling clients how they do, where self and match, as Katie will talk you through the steps, is a way that, that we are teaching students or clients how to individually self-reflect, and then they're also getting check-ins with staff. Um, so once you have your considerations guide completed, which is really what I like to call about like taking our behavior analytic brains and putting them into very simplified terms so that anybody who is not a behavior analyst who wants to learn about self-monitoring and how to use it as a tool to help their students can actually do it, right? We try to take all that jargon out to make it very approachable for people. Um, but when it comes down to actually the process of going through um, and evaluating a student, you are first going to have the student identify if they've engaged in a behavior or not. And as you mentioned, they can do that by circling yeses and nos or smiles and frowns or thumbs up and thumbs down. And that's very individualized for each learner. And then we have the staff come in or the parents or the clinicians that are supporting the student and they also evaluate, did the student do this? And they respond with their yeses and nos or smiles and frowns or thumbs up and thumbs down. And then once the student and once the staff have done their responses individually, then we look at comparing the answers and we're looking for yes matches and we're looking for no matches. And this is something that really sets the system apart from other self-monitoring interventions that are out there. When the student says, yes, I did do what I was expected to do. And the staff says, you're right, you did do what was expected of you. They get at least two points. They get one point for that honest self-reflection and they get one point for doing the expected behavior. And so that's where you have your yes match. Then if there is a no, if the student says, no, I didn't do what I was supposed to do. And the staff says, you're right. I agree with you. You didn't do what you were supposed to do. And it's a no match. They still get one point for that honest self-reflection. And so what we really want to do is to teach students that no is okay. No is an opportunity to learn. It's that taking advantage of that growth mindset, right? We all make mistakes. It's okay to make mistakes. 
We're glad that you were honest about that mistake. What can we do different next time so that we can improve upon that? And so that's that no match. So even when students have an, a moment where they didn't maybe do exactly what was expected and the staff says, you're right, you didn't, the staff can still say, but I'm so proud of you for being honest and self-reflecting. So even in, in a moment where they didn't do exactly what was expected, we can still give them that praise for that honest self-reflection and use it as a teachable moment. And so that really sets it apart from other systems that are out there. And then at some point in time, we add up their points and some of the students get access to reinforcement immediately. Some of them get it on a delayed schedule. You know, we have some students that have it on a very, very delayed schedule that it's, you know, even once a week or once a month. Um, at the end of the day, the student responds, the teacher responds, we compare answers, we see how many points they earn, and then at some point in time, they get access to reinforcement. I was just going to say, I remember in the workshop uh, thinking that how simply brilliant that was, that you weren't just, um, you know, they, they weren't just saying, yes, I did, the, uh, yes, I did what I was supposed to, no, I didn't do what I was supposed to, but that they're, they actually get credit for even in the errors, even in their mistakes, if they're able to self-report correctly, and if there's uh, if there's agreement, there's still some benefit there. And I think that that really is what makes what what makes uh, the whole system you know pretty special. And I remember thinking that at that moment. I think there's sometimes a misconception of when you can use self-monitoring, but it doesn't have to just be for reducing challenging behavior. So it can be for increasing academic skills or social skills, executive functioning skills functional, independent living skills, you know, you name it, you basically can self-monitor, right? Uh, we used to joke that the only time that you couldn't self-monitor was when you were sleeping. Uh, but now with technology and Fitbits and Apple Watches, you can even self-monitor your heart rate and your, you know, um, REM sleep during the course of the night with your all the technology we have. So um, it's really possible to self-monitor lots of different behaviors, not just those that you want to reduce. And you want to be able to reinforce that process so that kids want to monitor themselves on their own yeah. that, that becomes part of their life structure is you know how am I doing how am I doing in life am I meeting my goals am I achieving the things I want to do did I have a good day did I have a good um afternoon and you know what do I want to do to, to fix that going forward because that's kind of self-help is is yeah. a key. and who thinks to teach self-help to kids with a diagnosis of autism or ODD, I mean, we're so focused on on these 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 individual skills that this ability to monitor yourself, I think, is you you're right. It's so it's so crucial. And Robert, something that is so key is what you just hit on is most of us have learned the skill of self-monitoring. We do self-monitoring across our day so many different ways. Do you make to-do lists? That's self-monitoring. Do you set an alarm? I set an alarm to show up today on time. That was self-monitoring. Do I um, step on the scale every morning? Do I balance my bank account? All of these are ways that we self-monitor our behavior to make sure we're paying our bills, that we're showing up at meetings, that we have a calendar, that we're responding to things that are on our to-do list. But many of the individuals we work with have not yet acquired the skill of how to self-monitor. So whether you're using considered it, even considered it as an option, you know, it's no. like. So, you yeah. know, when you ask and, and Katie might have a different answer to this, but for me, you know, my life passion right now is teaching self-monitoring, whether you use self and match or not, like, I just want you to to bring this into your classroom, bring this into your homes, into your clinics, to, to think about how you're systematically going to teach a child to self-monitor their behavior, because I think that's a life skill that will go with them for the rest of their life. And don't forget to come check out our free workshop, How to Get Your Children to Listen Without Raising Your Voice or Nagging. Uh, it's available for you on the Just 7 Steps website at the page forward slash workshop. It's free for you, so please come check us out and uh, enjoy the information available to you there.